All right. Good morning, Solid Rock Church. How are you guys doing? Well, some of you found coffee. So just a couple of quick little things. If you are a child up to the fifth grade, you are dismissed, and you can go back with Jody and the uh, children crew back there, and you guys will enjoy a, a message about God in a level that you will enjoy and not fall asleep on. Uh, if you are a guest or a visitor here today, thank you so much for joining us at Solid Rock Church. But I, hopefully you got a yellow card. If you would just fill that out, either leave that in the little boxes on your table or the big box in the back. All that does is it allows us to reach out to you and say thank you for visiting and begin a dialogue with you guys. And if you have any questions about the church or anything that you want to know more about, that's the beginning of that process. So I hope you fill those on out. And today's going to be a little bit different. If you didn't know, we have a guest preacher here today, and so in a second, I'm going to bring up my good friend, John Price, who he and I have been uh, friends for 10 years, and we've been serving God in a variety of ways. Uh, We've worked together in summer camps. We've worked together in different ministries here in town, and he's brought a lot of his family and friends today, and I'm not going to exactly point them out, but you'll probably know who they are, so make sure you go say hi and go welcome them, because it is a great family who loves the Lord. And John is just an example of that as he goes out and he does some missionary work and he goes and he'll work a variety of sports camps for different kids in Africa and Cuba and a variety of places. He does rugby, baseball, whatever the kids will learn from to be a tool to know about Jesus. John will use that and he goes out and he supports other missionaries because believe it or not, when a missionary goes and goes and plants and goes and gets involved in a community, they're usually going to places that they don't get a lot of support. And so John makes sure to go and encourage them, supports them, and be a part of that process. And so he's traveled the world more times than I know. And I know in many of the times in our conversations, he's away more than he is here. And so I'm excited to bring him on up. So John, come on down and share God's message with us. Well, I'm very excited to be here today. The Bill and Matt finally let me preach after all these years. Yeah, I'm persistent. So, <laughs> uh, I love this church. You guys have been a part of our ministry uh, for a while, as Matt said. Um, me, I am a full time missionary, and my main mission is to go support missionaries. Sometimes that involves evangelistic outreach. But a lot of times that involves sitting across the table and encouraging them in the places where they need encouragement the most. And it's a wonderful job. Anything surrounding getting to enrich the lives of God's people with encouragement and preaching the gospel is where I want to be. And so I'm very, very thankful to be here today. You have wonderful pastors, Matt, Jordan, Bill, and it's been wonderful to see this church and all the people here. You have wonderful members of this church who have encouraged me, elders who have encouraged me, times and retreats that have meant a lot in my life being here. So I am overjoyed to be here to be able to preach. I can't say I'll do as good a job as you're used to, but I did hear that I have the most slides out of everyone (laughs) who has preached. And the funny thing about that is my father is a speaker, and he has at least 80 slides every time he speaks. And me and my, two of my sisters are here now, and they can attest that we tell him, Dad, you got to cut down the slides. So I am humbled to learn that I don't fall too far from the tree. <laughs> but we have a, I have a wonderful message that I'm excited to preach today, and I want to do that. Um, Before that, I want to open up out of the scripture today is going to be in Romans, Romans 5, 1 through 5. Uh, If you're able to stand, if you'll stand, I want to read God's word. You can follow along with me. It doesn't matter the version, it doesn't matter the language. This We are in Romans 5, 1 through 5. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. 
And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Amen. You may be seated. Let me open up us up in prayer. Lord Jesus, I know that right now I need your Holy Spirit. We all need your Holy Spirit. This is a place of worship, a place of prayer, a place of learning, and Lord, a place we want to know you better. Lord, teach us today, illuminate our hearts and our minds by your Holy Spirit to know your word and know who you are better. Let it bring our hearts hope and joy and peace. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for Jesus Christ. And we pray this in your name. Amen. All right. Title of today's sermon is The Pressure is on Rejoice. The Pressure is on Rejoice. Um, as Matt told you, I do mission work. One time we were doing, uh, after a hurricane really hit Abaco, the islands in the Bahamas, there was not one tree had a top on it left. And they were in, in dire need. And so I was with a team, me and my wife. My wife's not here today. Casey is definitely my better half. And we have a 10-month-old daughter. And they are wonderful and truly wonderful. They are in Virginia, where we live right now. And, but this time, we didn't have Evangeline yet. And Casey was with me. And we were traveling on a boat over to the Bahamas to bring aid. And I was the preacher. So going over there to preach. And on the way over there, they said, all right, we've got to get dinner. We've got to get lunch. Let's jump in the water. We're going to spearfish and get some fish and cook it and eat it. Well, this is my first experience spearfishing. But there I was. I'd kind of gotten the hang of it, missing fish after fish after fish in, in shallow water. And finally, I was upgraded to some deeper water. And I was down there, and I felt like I was one with the fish, right? I let the fish go by me that I wasn't going to hit, and I was just waiting for the big one. And I, I looked up, and there was a, a huge mackerel, like a zero mackerel, all right? And I knew that was the one, and my heart started pounding. And I pulled back. It's a sling spear. I pulled back, and I hit the fish, and it swam off to the, to the deepest area trying to escape. But it, but it, was, it was injured. It was, it was dying. And so when I found it, I knew I had to go down and get it. And it was about 40, 50 feet of water. So, so I, sw I swim down, hold my breath. And as you go down, I don't know if any of you have been diving or swimming. You, you have to equalize. So you, you blow your nose and you equalize. You equalize your sinuses. Everything's connected. Your ears, your sinuses, your nose, your mouth. And so I was trying to equalize. And I was going down, down, down. But I was excited. And I was just going down. Uh, I wasn't equalizing quite right. You see, I had, Matt said, I played a lot, a lot of rugby in my life, and I recently had sinus surgery, but at this point I hadn't, and I realized that my sinuses had issues. They'd been broken and cracked, and I wasn't able to equalize very well. And when I swam down to the bottom and got that fish, the pressure I felt was overwhelming. It feels like you're your head is going to explode. It's, and it's only 40 feet of water pressure. It's not, not that much. But I felt it. But at the same time, I got that fish and I swam to the top and I was holding it up over, out of the water to make sure that a shark didn't come get it. And my, my wife's on the boat watching and she looks at me and I'm just covered in blood. My nose just burst and my, I was just covered in blood. And, and I, but I was happy as can be. And I, I wish I had the picture. It's, it's in my phone, but I'm holding this fish just with a big smile on my face and blood everywhere, right? And pressure causes problems. Pressure is a problem. And the reason I titled the sermon, The Pressure is on Rejoice, if you notice in Romans 5, it says that we will have tribulations, okay? It says, and not only this, we also exult or rejoice in our tribulations. Your version, version might say trials. Well, this comes from the Greek verb phlebo, okay? The word tribulations comes from the Greek word phlebo, which means 
to be under heavy pressure. And so it, sometimes we think of trials as the external things that maybe Satan brings into our lives, or maybe, uh, you know, it's, it's not something that is our fault, or my, it's not normal, but we all experience pressure. We all experience those, that heaviness, and it can come from a lot of different directions. It can be self-induced. We can cause ourselves problems, right? right? It can come from exterior issues or people. We all experience pressures. Today, I want to talk about how we can rejoice under that pressure. The three points we're going to talk about today are how we can confidently press on, how we can be confidently resolute, and how we can be confidently hopeful in these trials, these tribulations, under the heavy weight of pressure of this world. Pressure comes from a lot of different places. Everyone can attest that sometimes you feel it on yourself. I might have been under the water, and it's very visible, very physical water pressures there. But we experience external pressures sometimes we aren't even aware of. We have relational pressures. Some of you have children who aren't following the Lord. Or you have brothers or sisters who aren't following the Lord. Family members, dear friends who are in trouble, have health issues. You might have health issues. We all experience financial pressure. I know if I'm in a fight with my wife, I'm under pressure. <laughs> or maybe I don't know I'm in a fight with my wife, and then I feel the pressure <laughs> before I realize what's wrong. We all have pressures. Some of you have deadlines for school, or exams, or papers, or work pressure. There is so many pressures in this world. I remember some of you, pressures can be good. Maybe, I remember when I was uh, asking my wife, actually, my pressure wasn't as much. My wife asked me to marry her, and then I asked her, so the pressure was off. But, but some of you, if you have that ring and you're going you're gonna to propose, sometimes right before you do, even though it's a really good thing, the last second your, your thoughts are, what if she says no? I mean, you're, you're sweating bullets. Some of you, when you find out a baby's on the way, expected or unexpected, it still brings about pressure. I remember when we found out, I found out that we were expecting, and uh, we found out we had twins on the way. And I felt more pressure. <laughs> we were potentially moving to a different country. We had twins on the way, and I felt pressure. And then I felt pressure when us moving to a different country, that imploded, and we were figuring out where we were going to be. And at the same time, we found out we lost one of the twins. And the grief of that was pressure. Loss of relationship, whether by death, loss of friends, loss of experience, loss of jobs, those things all apply a lot of pressure. And I think we can say, truthfully, they feel like trials and tribulations, and they're heavy upon us. There is a, a way we can handle pressure. And God doesn't say it's through stoicism, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, all right? Rub some dirt on it, do it by yourself. It's the American way, right? You should be strong, be tough. You don't need community, you don't need people, you just got to be tougher. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? Like, no, we can't handle everything that comes at us. And also, there's certain people and places and churches it says, that says, you should enjoy these, these trials. Enjoy this pressure. But that's a little uh, self-inflicting to enjoy self-inflicted wounds. It's not, you don't want to welcome that. No one wants grief. No one should welcome heaviness and trials and issues and problems. But God does say to respond to these things by rejoicing. A quote by Robert Haldane and a commentary I was reading for this really struck me. He says, Not only does the believer rejoice in hope of future glory, 
but he rejoices even in tribulations. This rejoicing, however, is not in tribulations considered in themselves, but in their effects. It is only the knowledge of the effects of afflictions and of their being appointed by his heavenly Father that enables the Christian to rejoice in them. Being in themselves an evil and not joyous, but grievous. They would not otherwise be a matter of rejoicing, but of sorrow. But viewed as proceeding from his heavenly Father's love, they are so far from depriving him of his joy that they tend to increase it. All these pressures, these trials, in of themselves, they're evil. They are worth our sorrow. You should lament. You should cry. You should say, this is awful. This is terrible. Death is not meant to happen. But it does. But in the knowledge of God's love and God's grace and God's plan for all of it, it should produce rejoicing. God doesn't just say, he doesn't just say, okay, don't be sad about it, rejoice. He gives us a step plan on how it gets there. The natural progression for why we can rejoice under pressure. And so the first thing in how we can rejoice is we, first we can be confidently pressing on because we know what God has done. The first thing we have to do is we look to the past. We look to what God has done to remind us that we can rejoice. We have to have confidence in a trustworthy God. If, if you have something you're really going to get through and you know it's hard, unless you know that the reward is on the other end, it's, it's, it's going to be hard to get there. But if you know, you can trust in what you're doing because it's happened over and over and over again, then it's worth it. And so we look to God's faithfulness to press on. Um, just a Paul, when he writes letters, I, I, he writes them, and every time he starts with the gospel. He starts with where we are in Christ Jesus. How can we navigate life if we don't know where we are with the God of the universe, the all-powerful, all-knowing, all-present God? And Paul says, therefore, verse 1, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. If we don't have peace, we have the opposite, war with God. If you don't know Christ, if you haven't been made right with God, justified, illegal, you are made right, you hit Christ's righteousness on you, and God looks at you, he's not seeing your sin and your failure. In the darkness of your heart, he's seeing the perfection of Christ Jesus. And because of that, we have peace with God. Because we said yes to Jesus. Because we have faith in Jesus Christ. But that's where our hope is. And because of that, we are justified with, with God. We're made right with God. So he starts there. Paul starts there. Listen, you're good. You're made right with God. Now let me tell you how to know God more. Now let me tell you how we get there. Um, when we're remembering what God has done for us, I think there's two places we can look. One, we can look at what God's done in our lives personally. I think every one of us has a testimony, right? Each person can remember the things God has done in their life, been faithful to them. I look at my wife every day, and I realize God is faithful and good and gracious. And when I forget that, Matt reminds me. <laughs> and the other place we can look is God's word. Sometimes we see God's word as a, a stuffy book or it's filled, we read it a certain way, but God's grace and love and the character of God, especially for those who are in Christ Jesus, is all over scripture. I love a book, it, a book it's called God's Way of Peace. It's an old book, so when I read this quote, just bear with me that it's a little bit in Old English. But I was reading this, trying to, it was a section on the gospel. And it says, hey, if we need to remember the gospel, if, we, if we're going to go about this to know who God is, to remember what God's done, 
then we have to look. We can look at the scripture. And he listed out verse after verse after verse. And I'm going to read them to you because the amount that's in here is what impacted me. Because sometimes I forget that God is truly gracious. So Horatius Bonner says, Let us hear then the words of God as to his own grace and mercy. The Lord passed pass by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Exodus 34, 6 through 7. The Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy. Numbers 14, 18. His mercies are great. 2 Samuel 24, 14. The Lord your God is gracious and merciful. 2 Chronicles 39. Thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful. Nehemiah 9, 17. His mercy endureth forever. 1 Chronicles 16, 34. Thou, Lord, our God, and ready to forgive and plenteous in mercy unto all them that call upon thee. Psalm 86, 5. Thou, O Lord, art a God full of compassion and gracious, long-suffering, and plenteous in mercy and truth. Psalm 86, 15. Thy mercy is great unto the heavens, Psalm 57.10. Thy mercy is great above the heavens, Psalm 108.4. His tender mercies are over all his works, Psalm 145.9. Who is a God like unto thee that pardons iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delights in mercy, Micah 7.18. I will love them freely, Hosea 14.4. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, John 3, 16. And God commends his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans 5, 8. God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he has loved us even when we were dead in sins, Ephesians 2, 4 through 5. The kindness and love of God, our Savior, toward man, Titus 3, 4. According to his mercy, he saved us, Titus 3, 5. In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent his only begotten son to the world, we might live through him, here in his love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. 1 John 4, 9 through 10. The only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1, 14. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John 1, 17. The word of his grace, Acts 14, 3. The gospel of the grace of God, Acts 20, 24. Such are a few of the words of him who cannot lie concerning his own grace. That was a long list. And the list goes on and on. And sometimes I go about my day and I doubt the grace of God. I doubt the character of God. I doubt the standing I have in God. But I, we need to remember what God has done for us. What Christ Jesus has done for us. When he was on the cross, and he said, it is finished. And we have the grace and the mercy of God in our lives. And so we, have, we should not forget that when we're needing to persevere and press on under these heavy pressures and trials. That's the first step. That's the first step in pressing on. Now, the next step in pressing on, the kind of the Bible, the scripture in Romans 5, if you go back to that, it gives us the step-by-step, -step, right? Not only this, but we rejoice in tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, so the pressure brings about pressing on, and the pressing on brings about proven character. Proven character in this means a testedness. It's not saying character is you're a great guy or you're a, a character, right? Sometimes Matt says that about me as a compliment. <laughs> it's not a compliment. Uh, but this is testedness, okay? This is going on. And, and how can we have, can we be confidently resolute? We can be confidently resolute by knowing what God is doing. Now, we've looked at what God has done. And you can look at the scripture to see that God is gracious. You can also look at the trustworthiness of God in that Christ was something completely different. Okay? 
Did you know there's a, a book and it has mathematical equations? And the mathematical equations deal with the prophecies that Jesus himself fulfilled. And Jesus fulfilled over 360 prophecies from Old Testament to what he did in, in life, in history in the New Testament. And if we take just eight of those prophecies, can anyone, I'm going to ask the crowd, can someone name something that would have been a fulfilled prophecy of Christ? Anyone? Taken, taken from the audience. Okay, All right. pierced. Born, born of a virgin, okay. Born in Bethlehem, and not just, like, there's two Bethlehems, born in the right Bethlehem, the smaller one, okay. What else? Okay, cast lots. We have, maybe he was from Nazareth. What else? Brought out of Egypt. He bruised for our iniquities. The, the beating he took. Whipped. The stripes he was whipped. Okay. All right, he was from the, the line of Judah. The house of Judah, the, the house of David. He was... Betrayed by a friend. That, that's 10, just off the top of our head. If you take eight of those prophecies, okay, the same mathematical probability that that would be fulfilled in one person is the same as if mathematically, if we took a silver dollars and we filled up the state of Texas with silver dollars a foot deep, okay? Then we take one of those silver dollars we put a red X on the back of it, toss it in randomly. I blindfold you, and I send you out there, and I go, okay, you get one pull, one chance to find that silver dollar. I'm going to start getting Texarkana. You can walk to El Paso. All right, no one wants to go to El Paso. Uh, and <laughs> and you got to find that silver dollar with the red X. You get one chance. If you do that, it's the same as if Jesus fulfilled eight of those prophecies. He fulfilled 360 of them. See, we have a God we worship that's different because we have a God we worship that's real. Christ, what he preached, was different than every other religion. He doesn't say, do this and God, God will give you eternal life. He says, I did it for you. I was having a conversation this morning with my brother-in-law about what is love, true altruistic love, and we came to the conclusion that only in Christ can we truly love. True altruistic love is nothing you get back from it at all. That's what Christ did. He said, here's eternal life. It is a free gift of God. You have to say yes to Jesus. Not, okay, do this, and then you get eternal life. No other religion in the world guarantees you a life made right with God or the higher power or eternal life with doing nothing in return because it doesn't make sense to us because we're human but God's love is divine the person of Jesus Christ was divine it was not human humanly orchestrated that Christ would fulfill 360 prophecies it's not even mathematically it's a number larger than it could fill this room if I had to write it it's impossible with man but possible with God that is the God we look to when he tells us to obey he tells us to have hope. He tells us you will get through this pressure and these trials. We look to God and we can press on. And that enables us to build our character. We're trusting God through those, those trials. So how can we be confidently resolute? By knowing what God is doing. I'm going to go a little nerd on you and quote Lord of the Rings here. <laughs> Frodo says, I wish it not, it need not have happened in my time. And Gandalf says, so do I, and so do all who live to see such times. But that is not for them to decide. All we have to do is decide what to do with the time that is given to us. How can we be confidently resolute, have proven character, stay in the present right now? We don't have the past. Whether you think the past personally was your glory days or whether you're carrying around your shame and your guilt, give that to the Lord and know that his present for you is better. 
is he has good works for you to walk in right now. He has made you for this time and this place and this purpose. We are all here to worship. We're all here today because of the divine God who wants us here. And his Holy Spirit is here with us, and it is doing something. The Holy Spirit, the powerful Spirit of God, is in us because of Christ Jesus, and it is at work, and it is doing something. If we look at when per, like how we build proven character, we look at characters in the Bible, uh, look at Joseph, right? He was sold into slavery. He was an arrogant kid, sold into slavery. He, went, he was in prison. He he, interpret, he was falsely accused. He was in prison. He interpreted dreams. He was forgotten about. And finally, God used him to save all of Israel and preserve the prophetic line to Christ so we could all be saved. And I'm sure in that time in prison and the false accusations and the trials and the pressure that he felt, he could have doubted God's plan for him. But by the knowledge of what God has done and God's faithfulness, by the Holy Spirit growing us, God gave him the character. It was produced. The character was being built. It was doing something. Right now, God is doing something in you, in me. It's at work. We, we aren't built overnight. God doesn't use, if we say, God, use us, he doesn't just go from, from zero to hero He puts the the pressure on to build us into people who have character that trust God in the present. And he does this by his word, but he does this by his Holy Spirit. In the the Bible it says, in Acts, oh no, it's not Acts, but here it is, John 14. He will give you a helper that he may be with you forever, John 14. 16 through 17. We have the Holy Spirit. He is with us. Don't look to the past. Don't look to your mistakes. Don't say, God can't use me. I've done X, Y, and Z. Christ's grace is sufficient for you. There is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. He has good works for you to walk in. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he has good works for you to walk in. Stay in the present. And just like the song was talking about God, what the enemy means for evil, God works for good. Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes all things to work for, together for good to those who love God. God is at work for our good. So, we have confidently pressing on because we know what God has done. We're confidently resolute because we know what God has is doing by the power of his Holy Spirit. And then we, so we can be confidently hopeful. We can be confidently hopeful because we know, know what God will do. We don't just have a God who is dead and we trust his words. We have a God that is alive. And not only do we have a God that's alive, but whatever your, your end times beliefs are, we know that Christ is coming back. He will come back. And we will be with him forever. He didn't create a people that would live and die and mean nothing. He made us for eternity. We will be with God forever, rejoicing forever. And whatever he's doing with our lives now, it means something and it has purpose. So one of my favorite songs is, it says, When we arrive at eternity's shores, where death is just a memory, and tears are no more. We'll enter in as the wedding bells ring. Your bride will come together and we'll sing. You're beautiful. I think of that song. I think about seeing lost loved ones. I think about seeing Jesus face to face. I think about rejoicing with all of you and us knowing each other fully, us knowing God fully as he fully knows us. We have a future hope. And it's a hope that will not disappoint us. I'm going to quote Lord of the Rings again. But uh, Gandalf says, It is not despair 
For despair is only for those who see the end beyond all doubt. What he's saying is if, if you know what's going to happen, then you have despair because it's hopeless. And what his, this version is, is actually, this is a, you can always have optimism if you don't know what's going to happen. But we have something more than that. We see the end. We know what's going to happen. We know Satan is defeated. We know we will be forever with God. We can see the end and have absolute hope instead of despair. And because we pressed on knowing what God has done, and because we built the character in our present knowing what God is doing, we have absolute certainty in the hope of what God will do. And in light of that hope, our priorities change. In light of the gospel, what does this what stuff matter? What does our small things we think will make us happy matter? Christ is everything. We have everything. And the more we look at the person of Jesus Christ and what that means and what that's given to us, the more it increases our knowledge and our hope of how much we truly have in him. I'm going to end today, and there's a word in Hebrew that the rabbis used to talk about. And this word is emet. It's the Hebrew letters Aleph, Mem, and Tav. And that's the very first, very middle, and very last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the rabbis used to talk about uh, emet means truth. And God is Alpha and Omega. God is the, the past, the present, the future, the beginning and the end. God is truth. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, the emet, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is our hope for our past, for our present, for our future. If you want to look to how to press on under pressure, under trials, look no further than to Jesus Christ. If you want to look to how to walk right now, today, look to the cross of Jesus Christ and what he's done for you. If you want to look to a hope of a future glory, that won't disappoint, look to Jesus Christ. Our finishing verses, but God demonstrates his love toward us. That while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I'm going to ask Matt to come up and he's going to tell us how to go into a time of prayer. But if, if, you're experience, if you know Jesus Christ and you're experiencing pressure today, trials and tribulations, we are not meant to deal with that by ourselves. We need each other. God made us for each other. Go to each other in prayer. Let's bear each other's burdens. Let's remind each other of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which gives us hope and can, it causes us to rejoice, to sing hallelujah, to sing holy, holy, holy. And if you're here today and you haven't said yes to Jesus, there's no better time than now. There's no better place to put your faith. There's nothing in this world that will give you hope that it doesn't disappoint except for Jesus Christ. Believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. You'll be justified and made right with God forever. I urge you to do that. Amen. All right, so as we normally do here at Solid Rock Church, we're going to go to a prayer time. And so many of you know with this routine, but if you're new here, we always like to end in prayer. And so maybe something happened in worship today that you want to pray over or have or pray with someone about. Maybe it was something in the message. Maybe it has nothing to do with any of that. And you just need to pray because I know we all need to have prayer. We're going to have some people available for prayer if you'd like to do that. As all, You can meet with someone at your table, maybe someone from your small group. Maybe someone that you don't know and is across the room and they look a little scary. Don't worry, I'm the scariest one here. It's okay. We're a warm, friendly group. But this is a time to go to the Lord and let him talk to you, to let him be here with you. Let whatever was in John's message, whatever's happened today, would you move in that? 
And so we've got Rick over here available for prayer. I see George is in the back. He'd be available to someone to pray. Stephanie's in the back. And if you're a woman and you'd rather pray with another woman, Stephanie's going to be available. I'm going to have John over here in the, this corner. John will be available for you to be prayed over. Um, I'll be available over by the coffee bar. And so this is just a time where these are some people that would love to pray with you. You don't have to tell them all the nitty-gritty stuff, but they're just available. They're not the only ones. There's a room filled with brothers and sisters in Christ who would be happy to pray with you about anything and just to be God's hands and feet of love to you right now. So shortly after this, we'll, be, we'll dismiss. We'll go have fun. We'll have fellowship. But right now, let us not rush through this sacred moment. So if you would join me in standing, and we'll go to a time of prayer.